At 9.20 a.m. on Saturday the 15th of June 1996, two men parked a Ford cargo truck on Corporation Street near to the junction with Cannon Street, Manchester City Centre. The truck contained the largest bomb ever planted on the UK mainland. And at 11.17 a.m., almost two hours later, the bomb exploded. Luckily nobody died that day, but 212 people were injured from shattering windows over a quarter of a mile away beyond the evacuation zone. The bomb had all the hallmarks of being the IRA and it was even claimed that a coded telephone message had been received informing the police of the bomb and claiming responsibility for it. Nobody would have doubted it being the IRA in 1996, especially as there were no other terrorist organisations operating on the British mainland at that time. But now, 21 years later, a fresh look at the circumstances and the evidence reveals that it may not have been the IRA responsible. So, if it wasn't the IRA, then who was it? The present day problems with ISIS, Al-Qaeda and this so-called war on terror didn't exist until after the events of 9-11 in 2001. So the 1996 Manchester bomb obviously couldn't be related to them. Now from my research, I believe that the people responsible for the Manchester bomb are what I call global elitist corporate businessmen. These are the same people who control politicians and political parties. They're behind the expansion of the European Union and ultimately a one world government. They may even be the same people that are controlling the really big business corporations and the news media. They operate without publicity and they have their own agenda, which they very rarely make public. Now, I'm not asking you to believe what I'm saying, but please listen to the evidence I'm presenting to support that. And then at the end of it, if you want to believe me, then that's fine and if you still don't believe that's fine also but anyone who planted the Manchester bomb which was the biggest ever on the British mainland must have had a specific agenda now this didn't exactly fit in with the IRA's agenda of death and destruction but it did fit in with a global elitist plan to build or rebuild Manchester using private investment. The reason why global elitists would bomb Manchester is steeped in history. Elitist corporate businessmen built Manchester up during the Victorian era to be the centre of the Industrial Revolution and they became very powerful and very rich on the back of that. Manchester also became the main trading post for the British Empire. However, during the interwar years of the 1930s, whilst the elitists were focusing their time and energy on creating a European Union and a world government and also the United Nations, they let the power in Manchester slip away from under their noses to the emerging Labour Party. Eventually, the Labour Party took enough seats on Manchester Corporation to take control of the Town Hall. The elitists would not have liked that and they would have done all they could over the following decades to regain control of Manchester. There are many factors that suggest that it was these elitists that planted the Manchester bomb and not the IRA. The four cargo truck containing the bomb was parked on Corporation Street at 9.20am on Saturday 15th of June 1996. Now, a Saturday is a bit of an odd day of the week to cause maximum chaos, 
because in Manchester City Centre on a Saturday morning there were generally no office workers working and by 9am most of the shop workers would have been in their shops ready for opening. For those people who knew Manchester in the 80s and 90s they would have known that the city centre didn't get busy with shoppers until late morning or around about lunchtime. So from the time the bomb being planted to it exploding was just under two hours. At 9.43am it's claimed that Granada Studios on Key Street received a coded telephone message from someone claiming to be the IRA and that they had planted a bomb in a vehicle on Corporation Street and that it would go off in one hour. Three years before the Manchester bomb in 1993, just down the road in Warrington, two bombs exploded in litter bins in their shopping area, killing two young children and injuring many more people. The IRA claimed responsibility for this, but blamed the police for the deaths, claiming that they gave half an hour's notice and that was ample time for an evacuation. The caller to Granada Studios claimed the bomb would go off in one hour, but the bomb actually exploded one hour 37 minutes after the coded telephone call. Quite generous by IRA standards compared with Warrington. At 10.46 the Army Bomb Squad arrived from their base in Liverpool and attempted to defuse the bomb with a remote control vehicle. However, at 11.17, the bomb exploded. I believe that if it had been the IRA behind the bomb, that they would have chosen a weekday, or certainly a Saturday afternoon, when the city centre was more busy. But what suggests for me that it was the elitist, is that they chose a Saturday morning, because they knew there would be no office workers in town, and very few shoppers at that time of day. Now let's have a look at the location in more detail. The Ford cargo truck containing the bomb was parked on Corporation Street, adjacent to one corner of Longridge House. Longridge House was an office block built in 1959 and in much need of modernisation. It was built at a 45 degree angle to the road and so there was much land both in front and behind it that was unused. Longridge House took the main brunt of the explosion and so was demolished not long afterwards. Adjacent to Longridge House was Marks and Spencers, built in the 1960s with a six storey office block above it. That too received severe damage during the explosion and was demolished just afterwards. On the opposite side of Corporation Street from where the bomb was planted is the Arndale Centre. This part of the Arndale has no shop frontages or entrances. It's a continuous external wall from just beyond Market Street along Corporation Street then over Cannon Street as a bridge along to Withy Grove. The Arndale Centre was built between 1971 and 1979. It was a horrible looking building constructed of cream coloured tiles on large concrete blocks. Protruding from the centre of the Arndale was a 21 storey office block also constructed of the same cream coloured tiles. Because of the cream coloured tiles, the Arndale gained a reputation as being the biggest public convenience in the world. On the website ManchesterArndale.com, they painted a rosy picture of the Arndale prior to the bomb, but in reality it was quite the opposite. During the 1980s and 90s, it was considered a no-go area for some shoppers, as gangs of youths roamed the malls, running into shops en masse and looting them. There were also many assaults and robberies in the Arndale, and the police set up a, a police station in the basement, ready to be on the scene in emergencies. Many of the shops closed down through lack of business and high rents, 
and the Arndale became the subject of jokes, stating that it needed a bomb under it. Also on the website manchesterandale.com, where they are discussing the bomb, they state that the average lifespan of a shopping centre is 10 to 20 years old, when the owners may decide to either do nothing, refurbish or demolish it. So as parts of the Arndale were already 20 years old, I wonder what their plans were. This rule of thumb also applies to office blocks. The High Longridge House and Marks and Spencers was the marketplace, also known as Shambles Square. Here there was quite a lot of offices and also shops that were finding it hard to get customers. Even though this area was not structurally damaged from the bomb, it too was demolished along with Longridge House and Marks and Spencers. At this point, where I say that global elitists are behind the bomb, I'm not saying in any way that anyone connected with Longridge House, Marks and Spencers, the Arndale Centre, the marketplace shopping area or offices, I'm not saying that anyone that has anything to do with them are connected in any way with this bomb. If it had been the IRA, then I don't believe that they left the van with the bomb where they did. The route they must have taken to get there was probably from Albert Square along Cross Street onto Corporation Street, and they must have passed several high profile spots where it would have been more beneficial to leave the vehicle with the bomb. They could have targeted the Town Hall and Central Library, or even Bootle Street Police Station, but as they drove along Cross Street, they had already passed the banking area and the elitist shopping area of King Street, and then further along, getting closer to Market Street, they could have targeted the elitist Royal Exchange and the far corner of the Arndale, and also the shops on Market Street and St Mary's Gate. But then they drove over the junction with Market Street, past Marks and Spencers, and stopped it just before the junction with Cannon Street, just going out of the shopping area. There were also several other locations in the city centre that had been more beneficial to the IRA. They could have driven up Fountain Street and left it at the junction of High Street with Market Street. Here they could have targeted Debenhams, Lewis's, the Arndale Centre and many of the shops on Market Street. But probably more beneficial to them, they could have targeted the Metrolink tram system that ran along High Street onto Market Street and that would have put the service out of business for a very long time. But where the bomb was planted, I believe, is ideal for the elitists. Longridge House was demolished. Marks and Spencers and the office block above it were demolished. The marketplace shopping centre and office block down to Deansgate that were not structurally affected by the bomb were demolished. And part of the Arndale from Cannon Street to Withy Grove, up Withy Grove to High Street, that was not affected by the bomb, was also demolished. But strangely enough, the part of the Arndale closest to the bomb was not demolished and not even refurbished. It just received a new outer walling. I believe that probably the target of the elitists in placing the, the bomb in the van there was to also destabilise the 21 storey office block that protrudes out of the Arndale. Unfortunate for them, the Arndale was built of so much concrete that it didn't even wobble during the explosion. So as we can see now in 2017, the whole of the immediate city centre around where the bomb was has been redesigned and rebuilt, fitting nicely into the plans of the elitists. Within days, the Deputy Prime Minister Michael Heseltine from the Conservative government 
announced that there would be an international competition to rebuild Manchester City Centre. Well, first of all, why an international competition? Is that because these elitists work on a global scale? And first of all, why was the government announcing a competition? We didn't hear from Man anything from Manchester City Council at the time, who were all for blocking out private investment. It seemed that within no time at all after the bomb, plans must have been drawn up, submitted for costings, submitted for planning application, but within no time at all, new buildings were starting to be erected and the city centre was beginning to take on a new identity. Rather strange that this could happen so fast. Was it that these plans had already been designed in advance? Since the bomb, millions of pounds has been invested in the city. And prior to the bomb, where there was no residential properties in the immediate city area, there has now been a property boom with flats and apartments. Before I mention the police investigation into the bomb, I just want to mention the relationship between Manchester City Council and the elitists. And certainly from uh, at least the late 1970s until the time of the bomb, there was great friction between the two of them that was spilling out into the public domain. And uh, this friction drew in the uh, Greater Manchester Police and they were used as a lever to try and put pressure by the elitists on Manchester City Council. Now, in 1980, Manchester City Council became the first local authority in the country to declare the city a nuclear-free zone. And uh, everybody just thought it was the loony left of the Labour Party and they couldn't understand this, especially as there was no nuclear facilities around Greater Manchester and if the Russians dropped a bomb on us then it certainly wouldn't be nuclear free then. But what people didn't realise that this wasn't relating to nuclear uh, bombs or nuclear energy. It was symbolic of the nuclear being the elitist and they were declaring it was an elitist free zone just to rub their noses in it. So the elitists then started using James Anderton, who was the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police between 1974 and 1991, to basically do the elitists dirty work for them. And uh, there was much press publicity throughout the 80s about the tensions and bickering between James Anderton and the police committee, later the police authority, and the Labour-controlled Manchester City Council. Now, in 1982, when things were probably going from bad to worse between the elitists and the council, the Labour-controlled council, James Anderton said in a speech, well, just bear in mind that the police are supposed to be political impartial, but James Anderton said, and I quote, I see in our midst an enemy more dangerous, insidious and ruthless than any face since the Second World War. A long-term political strategy to destroy the proven structures of the police. So things were really hotting up then between the elitists, Greater Manchester Police and the Labour-controlled City Council that each were trying to get back at each other one way or another. Now, in 1982, the Pope came to Britain. And Manchester was one of only about three or four places he visited. But uh, he didn't come to Manchester City Centre. And I think this was a deliberate ploy by the elitists to bring the Pope to Britain at that time. And the Pope went to meet the masses of the public at Heaton Park, about three miles north of the city centre. 
Now, a policewoman was chosen to personally meet the Pope and represent the police. And it turns out whether it was coincidence or planned, but the father of that policewoman was the editor of the Northern Edition of the Daily Mirror, printed in Manchester. And the elitists control the media, they control newspapers, the BBC and other mainstream media. So was that again to rub the noses of the council in, in it? And it was all starting to build up after that. And the police again were dragged into it. Now, in March 1984, John Stalker was appointed the Deputy Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police and uh, he knew James Anderton from the very early days of their career and um, John Stalker mentions in his biography <clears throat> about the relationship between him and James Anderton that it wasn't the best relationship and it wasn't the best start to him being James Anderton's deputy and within two months something obviously went on between John Stalker and James Anderton and John Stalker was sidetracked and he was sent to Northern Ireland to investigate what seemed to be the impossible investigation of the shoot to kill policy and because John Stalker got too close to the truth, in May of 1986 he was set up and suspended on trumped up allegations to remove him from the shoot to kill investigation and also his position as Deputy Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police. Now, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll mention later, Detective Chief Inspector Gordon Much, who led the inquiry into the 1996 Manchester bomb, he was also set up on trumped up allegations and suspended from duty and from the inquiry into the 1996 bomb. All starts to get a bit familiar at this stage. <clears throat> Now, just going back to 1984, Graham Stringer was appointed leader of Manchester City Council, and I'll mention a little bit more about him shortly. But 1986, things were going from bad to worse in the relationship between the police and Manchester City Council. And as a means of getting back, uh, the council, Labour Control Council, spent vast amounts of ratepayers' money on producing magazines called Police Watch, where they would basically slag off the police. And I've got two here. These are actually issue number five and six from 86 and 87. And... It's a terrible waste of ratepayers' money and it was just clear that they were out to bash the police and James Anderton in any way they could. Uh, but they seemed to take sides with John Stalker, so maybe they recognised what was going on uh, in the higher echelons of Chester House, the head office of Manchester, Greater Manchester Police. Now also in 1986, there was um, a police constable on foot patrol, uh, only a matter of yards from where the 1996 bomb exploded. And it was the very early hours of uh, one morning when he was checking his property before he finished his shift. And at the side of Marks and Spencer's behind Longridge House, where the 1996 bomb exploded this police officer found uh, a large device on a windowsill and he described that as being around about 18 inches long about six inches width and on a base it contained what appeared to be 
a large clump of plasticine with wires coming out of it and a battery taped to it and first instincts for anybody you'd think uh, a bomb so this police officer um, moved to a safe distance and radioed his control and Greater Manchester Police at the time had what they called a bomb squad they weren't there to detonate bombs move them or do anything with them they were purely there to cordon off areas and evacuate if need be now the police officer the police constable radioed in this police bomb squad were called and nothing else was apparently heard of it and um, before the police officer finished duty he asked the supervisory officer who was there what had happened as no army bomb squad had been called in there was no radio messages about it and the police constable was basically told forget about it now uh, don't talk about it and when he asked what had happened to it um, the supervising officer became you know, all edgy and didn't know what to say and he told the police constable that it had been thrown in the river well something that looks like a bomb um, why would they touch it in the first place uh, even if it was a hoax why was it thrown in the river why was it not preserved for forensic examination and the whole story seems to be uh, a bit strange so more questions have to be asked of that as well um, was this a real one but because the police officer found it too early uh, they decided to call off whatever the plan was uh, maybe it was on a remote control mechanism so that it would have been easy to... now as I said in 1984 Graham Stringer became leader of Manchester City Council and he just stepped right into the middle of this uh, three-way I wouldn't call it a debate friction war whatever you want to call it between the elitist Greater Manchester Police and the Labour Party on Manchester City Council and it's claimed publicly that um, he was relying on Labour winning the 1987 general election where they would have had more support to take on the elitists and just to remind you the Labour policy was to invest only public money in regeneration and the infrastructure and block out private investments and this is the crux of what all the arguments and disagreements was about now when Margaret Thatcher won her third term in office in 1987 it's claimed that uh, he wrote to the government and in a nutshell he says okay we give in you've won will allow some private investment into Manchester so this seemed to be a turning point in 1987 and it was in the years that followed that that uh, Manchester made its Olympic bids uh, there was certainly regeneration around the Eastlands area uh, around the area now where Manchester City's stadium is uh, which was eventually used for the Commonwealth Games so there was initially plenty of investment around there none in the city centre at that stage and then in 1991 uh, the government funded the Metrolink tram system to come to Manchester this meant that the Manchester to Bury railway line and the Manchester to Altrincham railway lines they both closed they were converted to the Metrolink tram system and they were linked together by tram lines through the streets of Manchester city centre now this went ahead and it appears 
that certainly up to the 1996 bomb, the only investment in the city centre was the Metrolink tram system and the city council would have had no control over the conversion of the railway lines anyhow and so the only leeway they gave was the Metrolink running through the city streets. So probably up to 1996 the elitists were really getting frustrated with the council then and they started trying to get back at them in any way they could and prior to that the, I mentioned the elitist newspapers and the media being controlled by them they used the what they called the Fleet Street to the north uh, the printing of the newspapers in Manchester they used that as a lever as well to get at the City Council and Thompson House where they printed the Daily Mirror and many other papers uh, they moved out in 1987 to a new uh, printing venue out well outside the city area in fact out of Manchester altogether in 1989 the Daily Express moved out from Great Ancoat Street uh, which was quite a surprise then because only less than a decade earlier they'd invested millions of pounds in the uh, the plants there to print the Daily Star and less than a decade later they closed all that down and they went elsewhere as well and soon to follow um, the BBC announced that it was going to start broadcasting and have their headquarters at Salford Keys in Salford just over the border from Manchester and to follow that the BBC on Oxford Road they moved out and so it meant that all the media that was in the immediate city centre went from being a very strong northern base to nothing at all and all this is all the tit for tat that went on between the elitists and the council so it seems that Graeme Stringer maybe uh, as he was the leader and probably the negotiator and he was put in a position where he had to stick with Labour policy of only allowing public money and also keeping the elitists happy but he seemed to still block or the Labour Council st still blocked any further investment in the city and that probably is what led up to the 1996 bomb and on top of all that I just want to mention that in no way I am blaming Graham Stringer, James Anderton, John Stalker or anyone else I'm, <coughs> excuse me, mentioning in this video as being any way responsible for the Manchester bomb so let's now look at the police inquiry in a bit more detail. Now the police were investigating it from day one to be the IRA and uh, I don't know and I guess no one will know how much of the evidence that was made available to the public was true or fictitious. Now Yes, fictitious information can be made public by the police or governments and it's naive to think otherwise. And uh, what was released to the public doesn't prove that it was the IRA at all and some of the evidence just doesn't make sense. <clears throat> now the police investigation was led by Detective Chief Inspector Gordon Much from Brutal Street Police Station and it was a joint operation with Special Branch and MI5, the Secret Services. Now at the time the police in Manchester were aware 
that um, there was a, an IRA terrorist cell operated in London and right from day one they assumed that they were responsible for the Manchester bombing and they started investigating this and never investigated any other possibilities whatsoever. Now let's have a look at the Ford cargo truck that contained the bomb in more detail. Now the police say it was sold by a dealer in Peterborough two weeks prior to the bombing who in turn sold it on to somebody called Tom Fox. Now they say, the police, that they examined every piece of CCTV footage from across England within two days of the bombing to find the whereabouts of the van. Now, to examine every single CCTV across the country that's running 24 hours a day when you don't know when and where the vehicle was driven from Peterborough would have taken a lot more than two days of man hours and what they actually say was that the vehicle was driven on the Friday the day before not two weeks before but the day before from Peterborough down the M1 into London and then it was tracked again driving back up the M1 later that evening around about 7.40 p.m. And the police then say that the next sighting of it was the following day, the Saturday morning at 8.31, where it was spotted driving along the M62 towards Manchester. So some questions that haven't been answered here are between the vehicle being sold two weeks prior to the bombing up until the day before the bombing where was that vehicle and also the overnight the night before the bombing where was it stored now the police are assuming because they've got no evidence of this <clears throat> that the vehicle was driven to London filled with the bomb material and then driven back north now, if you're driving north from London and you want to come into Manchester, you would most likely come up the M6 off the M1, then come off just after the Nutsford services and then along uh, the A556 and up Princess Parkway into Manchester. But uh, for some reason, it didn't take that route and they found that it travelled from the Warrington area into Manchester. Now there are lots of questions that need to be answered around the CCTV footage and the movements of the vehicle because uh, there was no continuous footage of the vehicle from being sold to the time the bomb exploded in it two weeks later. Now one month later after the Manchester bomb on the 15th of July the Metropolitan Police arrested six suspected IRA men in London and they were all tried and convicted of conspiracy to cause explosions at National Grid electricity stations and they all got 35 years in prison each and they were of course or would have been um, interviewed regarding the Manchester bomb and they all denied it and there wasn't a shred of evidence to prove that they were responsible so no one from London was charged with the Manchester bomb and there were no other suspects from London so you would have thought then they'd have turned their attention to investigating certainly a northern cell of the IRA or even looking for other people that may have been involved but uh, obviously not they were still insisting that it was this London cell because um, one way of looking at it the bomb making material got on the van somehow 
and if it was the elitist, which I believe it is, the vehicle could have been driven to an army base to have the materials loaded on it, or those sightings could have been totally fictitious anyhow just to uh, try and make it fit for the um, the six men in London. Now early in 1999, three years after the bombing, uh, where they were still no closer to uh, arresting anybody involved in it, um, one of the Manchester Evening News reporters, um, he had a tip-off where it named somebody in Ireland, Northern Ireland, as being responsible for the Manchester bomb. And suspicious, suspicion fell on Detective Chief Inspector Gordon Much as the police officer who leaked that to him and as a result both of them were arrested arrested and detective chief inspector gordon much was tried for misconduct in public office and that went to crown court and uh, he was acquitted there was no evidence to prove that and it appears, just like with John Stalker that I mentioned earlier, that he was set up either to remove him from the investigation into the Manchester bomb or to remove him from links to find somebody in Ireland responsible. Or maybe he may have suspected that it was someone other than the IRA responsible as well. So... That's just the evidence in brief. Uh, I mentioned the getaway car. Um, the getaway car, it was stated that it was parked on Exchange Street, uh, where the two men who parked the bomb van walked back to to make their getaway. Now, at the beginning of this video, I show footage of the van parked up and to walk back to Exchange Street, these uh, two people responsible must have walked face on into the camera. And certainly, if not that one, there must have been other cameras around the Exchange Street, St. Mary's Gate area of Manchester that would have picked these people up and been able to identify them. Now, something rather odd that's come from the investigation is that there was very few appeals for help from the public there was no photo fits of the people responsible released to the public there was no request for sightings of the vehicle there was no request made to the public for help in tracking down the offenders and for such a major crime like this the police would have most certainly normally relied on the public to help provide information but none of that at all which uh, is rather suspicious under the circumstances. Now on the 9th of May last week I had a <coughs> excuse me I arranged a meeting with retired Detective Chief Inspector Gordon Much and uh, he agreed to meet me and we, we met in a cafe and um, I told him about my research into the bomb and I even explained to him that I didn't believe it was the IRA. Now initially I didn't think he would have spoken to me at all but uh, he did. I didn't record the interview but what I did, I did take notes at the time and beforehand I drafted out a series of questions I wanted to ask him. I could have asked him hundreds and hundreds of questions, but I felt that the more I pursued it, that he would have declined to answer anything or I, I may have put him off speaking openly about what happened. 
So uh, just have a look at my video diary now and uh, you'll get a better idea of what went on on the day. Video diary the 9th of May 2017. I've just returned from a meeting I've had with uh, retired Greater Manchester Police Chief Inspector Gordon Much. Um, Gordon was the in, lead investigating officer of the Manchester bomb in 1996. And as part of my investigation into it being someone or another group other than the IRA, I wanted to uh, ask Gordon a couple of questions about the investigation and also sort of sound him out on what he thinks of my uh, view that it was somebody other than the IRA. So before I met him I set out a list of questions, some basic ones because I knew he wouldn't answer anything confidential and I presented the list to him to read over first of all so he got the idea of what sort of things I wanted to discuss with him and then we went through the questions that I'm going to read out here one by one and his answers so uh, I took some notes at the time of his answers and I started off by asking him who had overall control of the investigation the CID from Bootle Street or Special Branch and he, he told me that it was a joint investigation between the CID and Special Branch because obviously Special Branch uh, investigate anything or have anything to do with terrorism or the IRA and he also mentioned that he was also had been a special branch officer. Did special branch openly share information with you? And the answer to that was yes, because obviously it was a joint investigation. I asked him if MI5 assisted with the investigation, to which he replied yes which is what I expected the answer to be, uh, bearing in mind the nature of what had happened. So the next question, did you feel you were ever obstructed or blocked in the investigation by higher people? And uh, I explained to him that by higher people I meant by government, senior government or even hire people, anybody not connected with the government and uh, he answered yes, uh, he said that he was head of a team and everything had to be sanctioned by MI5 but it was clear that there was a bigger picture with the government as to how the investigation was uh, carried out. He didn't expand on that but uh, I think that was enough to say that um, it was going in one particular direction. Was it ever investigated that it could be anyone other than the IRA that was responsible? I asked him and he just replied all the evidence pointed to the IRA. I asked him if he then believed 100% that it was the IRA, to which he replied yes 100%. And I asked him, do you now still believe 100% that it was the IRA, to which he replied yes. Now Gordon was the only person arrested in connection with this, which is surprising considering he was the investigating officer but it was claimed that he leaked information to a Manchester Evening News reporter and uh, I asked him if he thought he was set up when it was claimed that he leaked this information and uh, he replied yes. He expanded on it that uh, he felt that this was probably linked to the government's Good Friday Agreement and the peace process 
that was taking place in with Northern Ireland and he felt that the investigation into the bombing needed to be delayed and he was used as a scapegoat. I then went on to ask him about the Ford Granada which was the uh, so-called getaway car and if it was ever traced and uh, he told me that it was found in Preston later that day and uh, I asked him to expand a little bit more around the Granada he told me that there was two men and the driver that were seen to get into it on Exchange Street in Manchester around the corner from where the bomb vehicle was left and it was found in Preston near the railway station now without any prompting uh, he gave a surprising answer that he felt that they drove there because Preston had good railway links to different parts of the country and uh, he, he implied that they left the car there and then got a train probably back to London <clears throat> which is very surprising that someone involved in such a crime, the biggest bomb ever planted on mainland Britain, they'd use a getaway car to drive 30 miles to a railway station to then get public transport. And uh, if they did want to use public transport, why not go straight to Manchester Piccadilly and get a train to London from there? But uh, I found that quite hard to believe. I uh, said to him that I felt that there was a lack of appeals from the police for sightings of the vehicles, descriptions of uh, people responsible, photo fit pictures etc and I asked him why that was and uh, he told me that that was a higher decision because they didn't want to be inundated with thousands of calls from the public that they'd find hard investigating uh, which surprises me really because a serious crime like that you would ask for public help and regardless of how many calls you get from members of the public they'd all need to be investigated unless there was another reason why they didn't do that I asked him if other than the arrests of six IRA men in London on unconnected charges or allegations and they, they were actually interviewed in relation to this I asked him why there were no other arrests from other IRA cells possibly in the north of England and he <coughs> excuse me he replied that they never found any other links with any other cells or anyone in the north. Was any other links, any evidence or information not connected to the IRA ever investigated? And he just briefly replied no, only the IRA. Um, I told him it was claimed that there was a suspect in Northern Ireland who was never brought to justice because of the peace talks. I asked him if that was just propaganda and he, he says no there was someone, a suspect in Northern Ireland but because of the peace talks uh, that never actually came to anything. And the last question that I wrote down was that you, you get the idea from the above questions, what I'm aiming at. Is there anything you want to openly tell me that can help me uh, with my investigation or shed more light on this? To which uh, he just replied, no. So I didn't want to pursue it anymore. Um, he knows where I come from. I told him the reasons why I believe this. 
um, that it's all connected with the running of Manchester City Council and the Labour policy of only allowing public money to be spent within the City of Manchester and blocking out private investment and that I believed that it was someone other than the IRA that wanted to bring about change and new investment in the city and that uh, it would take drastic measures to do this. I also went on to tell him to prompt some further answers from him. I told him that I felt that the timing of the bomb being placed, the van being parked up at 9.20am on a Saturday morning to detonate two hours later when there were no office workers in Manchester. I thought that was quite convenient but also you'd had the initial sort of swathe of shop workers coming in ready to start for nine. Um, Manchester in them days never got busy with shoppers until about noon anyhow. So I told him that I thought that was rather unusual that the IRA would pick that time and day. And he did reply, well, there was a European football match at Old Trafford that evening. And I said to him that, well, if that was the case, that it was that they wanted to disrupt, why didn't they park the van at Old Trafford? He then went on to say that he believed that it was probably meant for London, but there was a, a ring of steel around London because of some parade that was taking place that day, uh, which I also found a bit hard to believe and accept that answer. Um, nothing really came from it. I didn't expect him to suddenly accept what I had to say. And I would say that he is not likely to change his view neither. Um, I left it at that then and uh, the interview was probably over within about 35-40 minutes. So he, he knows where I'm coming from now. I'm not so sure he'll get back in touch with me with anything else. But uh, one thing I am quite sure is that I'm sure he'll be talking to other people about this. He, even though he's retired, uh, I do feel that he still has friends in high places. Um, but we'll have to see where this goes. Okay, so... Uh, We'll leave it there for now. I've got to arrange other people to interview and we'll go from there. OK, speak soon. My video diary made after my meeting with Gordon Much. Now, it's very easy for the government or politicians or the police to blame the Northern Ireland peace process as to why nobody was eventually arrested and charged with the Manchester bomb. But it, that would still not prevent the police from carrying out their investigations and charging somebody. It would have been down to the Crown Prosecution Service to decide whether anybody went to court with it or whether as part of the peace process they were allowed to get away with it basically. But I don't believe the Northern Ireland peace process had anything to do with this because a month after the Manchester bomb the six men in London that were part of the IRA cell down there, they were arrested on conspiracy charges and each received 35 years imprisonment and that didn't have anything to do to affect the Northern Ireland peace process. 
Now in the days and the weeks following the bomb, Manchester and probably the whole of the country were in shock from what had happened. But uh, there seemed to be a change in direction in Manchester Town Hall virtually overnight. The hard line they took on public stroke private investment in the city seemed to change. The nuclear free zone rubbish they had that that was dropped and also in 1996 Graham Stringer stepped down from being the leader of Manchester City Council and the following year he packed in local politics all together and stood for the safe seat of Blakely to be a parliamentary candidate which he did win. The new era was a building boom where private investment was being spent on rebuilding Manchester city centre. Whereas before the bomb there was no residential properties, there was also a building boom on new flats and apartments and since 1996 to today not just millions but billions have been spent on rebuilding Manchester and giving it a new identity. I'm just going to read something I've just recently taken off the internet about investment in Manchester and it's called Manchester an attractive city to overseas investors. In part due to all the regeneration occurring in Manchester it is now gaining significant attention from overseas investors. German investors have named Manchester as the most important city outside London for investment and German bank Decker have paid 164 million for the new office block at 1 St Peter's Square. Manchester is also the largest economic area outside London with 56 billion gross value added. The flow of cash into Manchester does not look like it is subsiding as Germany is expected to spend another £200 million in the city before the end of the year and that was before the end of last year 2016 and that just relates to German companies but not only German companies uh, there's companies from all over the world investing in Manchester now so uh, certainly a different city today than it was back in 1996. Now as I said earlier on in the video uh, I'm not asking you to believe everything I'm saying here about the elitist being responsible but uh, I've covered most of the evidence there's still a lot more I've not covered in this video but I've covered the main facts and based on what I'm saying if you still do not want to believe me then that's fine but if you do believe what I'm saying then that's fine too so I'm going to leave you now and thank you very much for watching this video